Can I move a little bit closer just so I can see them around the corner? Yeah. Okay. Can I come forward a little bit? Okay, how's that? Right, let's make a start because otherwise it'll be bedtime. Ready? Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the third of these talks. What started out, as people in church were just saying, what started out as one talk became two talks, and what became two talks has now become three talks. But I do promise you, by the time we finish tonight, that will be it, at least for a while, until we come up with a fourth talk. No, we, we, we'll try and come up. Uh, we'll keep, for those of you who are interested, we'll try and keep up to date. I do thank you for all of you who've joined on uh, physically in church over these three sessions. I also thank those who have joined online and those who watch, have watched the catch-ups and everything like that. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of all this, I'm a local Anglican vicar in a village church, or a couple of village churches. I'm not a renowned expert in any way. Some people have been studying this stuff for 30, 40 years. Um, I've been involved with it for the best part of a year. Um, so these are but some humble reflections rather than the definitive answer to all this. But what's interesting is the number of people who have spoken to me, or it's come up in conversation, probably because I've brought it up, but the number of conversations I've had with both people um, within the life of the church, but way beyond the life of the church, about this sort of thing, has been very interesting. Um, both the number of people who know a lot more about it than perhaps most people would think they would, and also the number of people who are genuinely interested in what we're talking about. So it's, it's a good thing that we're doing. So let's just recap. We've had two sessions so far. This is our third session. And um, we'll begin, first of all, with a prayer, I think, because that would be good. Lord Jesus, as we gather together tonight for the third of these sessions, looking at this uh, incredible historical artifact that many would see as your burial cloth and indeed even your resurrection cloth. We pray that we not only focus upon what we're doing tonight, but hold in the background in our hearts and in our minds the bigger picture of your love for this world and your desire for its transformation and its healing. We pray this not just for the whole world, but also for people's individual lives. And as we share this time together, and emerge, hopefully, from this pandemic over these coming days. So help us to listen to one another. Help us to listen to your Holy Spirit as we share this next hour together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this particular session I've entitled Looking at the Science particularly at the image in the cloth and also the beginning of a conversation about some of the implications of what all this might mean to us. If you could put the next one up for us, George. That would be lovely. Thank you. We're not going to go back over everything because otherwise that would take up the whole time. But just to remind people, we did begin by looking at what we know about the history of the shroud and the fact that we can, we've got a fairly firm history from 1350 onwards, once it appeared at a place called Leary in France. Next one, please, George. I'm not going to go through necessarily all these dates, but just to give you a very brief history and just fill in two things that I found out even since I shared with you that first talk. If we one of the arguments has been to can we predate the shroud at all from 1350 or is that the earliest we know of its, of its existence? What we know, and I've mentioned before, was that it had got from somehow from Constantinople in 1204 to Lyria in France in 1350. 
there's been a couple of hypotheses as to how that happened, including a strange image that appeared in, uh, in Somerset here um, as part of the Knights Templar. But what one of the latest um, studies that's just been released has been to do with the genealogy of a particular family in France that were present in the raid in Constantinople by the French and by the Venetians where, who basically looted and, and ransacked Constantinople in retaliation for non-payment by the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Byzantine Empire, for um, protecting them. So because they didn't pay, they, they went in and, and they ransacked. And this particular knight ended up becoming the Duke of Athens. There seems to be a very strange... We talked, to, if you remember, in the first talk we had of these sort of little, like little space shuttles that often in Star Wars suddenly disappear from the big mothership at the last minute and this knight seems to have left Constantinople right at the last minute and gone to Athens and there's no real explanation for why he did that. Um, he was a famous knight so he wasn't scared of being in a battle. And then what happens is they've now managed to trace the lineage of this knight and his return to, uh, to Burgundy um, in the, about the 1230s, and then the life of the family through right down to the lady who married the gentleman who ended up producing the shroud in 1350. So it's like those of you who are into genealogy, there's actually quite a clear lineage. It's the granddaughter of the granddaughter. So it came down the matriarchal line. That seems now to be the most likely explanation of what happened to the Shroud during that period of, of not knowing what, what happened between 1204 and 1350. So that's one new piece of information. The other is slightly even more strange. We go back through 1204 to 944 um, when it arrived in Constantinople to 544 when it was known as the image of Edessa and I made quite a thing in that first talk of the relationship between the famous piece of art from um, St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai in Egypt um, called Christ the Pant Pantocrator um, and the very close similarity to the Shroud of Turin beyond what would normally be considered in a court of law, way beyond, four or five times more points of congruence and from which a load of art throughout the world has come. They've actually found a couple of earlier pieces of art, um, but in a very strange place, in Ravenna in Italy, dating earlier than the famous painting in um, St. Catherine's Monastery. Why is that interesting? Is that what seems to most likely to have happened is that we thought there were actually almost possibly two shrouds, one from Antioch and one from Edessa. And I'd struggled with this in my thinking too, because if you ended up with two, how do you know which one's the right one and all sorts of other things. And they could only have, if, the, if it was the genuine article, there was only ever one. So how in the world did they know? But what seems to have happened is it's all to do with something we haven't got time to go into tonight, which is called Arianism. And it was a particular group or sect within Christianity which, a bit like the Catholics and the Protestants at various points in the English history, depending on who was in, they were either in power or they were being hounded out. Yes, does that make sense? So at certain times the Catholics were in and certain times the Protestants were in and Oliver Cromwell and all that and, and Mary Queen of Scots and probably some of you know much more about all this than I do. But it's the same with the Arians and the Orthodox, the Byzantine Empire. And it seems as though what happened in Antioch was that people went into Antioch, the Orthodox went into Antioch, and the Arians who were in charge of Antioch at the time, and so had the shroud, they fled, but they fled to Ravenna in Italy because it happened to be that the Germanic tribe there was Christian but it also shared this Aryan faith. 
And then it seems to have gone from there in 530, about 530, 535, to Edessa, which isn't that far, strangely, from Antioch. So it sort of went out all the way to Italy and then back. And that's how it ended up in Edessa. Because there's no link, direct link, from Antioch to Edessa. And so it's almost like otherwise two, two shrouds emerged. But actually it makes much more sense. You're looking as though you, you're completely going, what? It fills in quite an important link in the history so that there's actually one shroud that goes throughout the whole of history. First of all called the Christ icon. If you remember back to when we did the, 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 the discipline of the secret, you know, we didn't have any images because it was under Roman Empire and, you know, scared of being found out. Then it becomes, um, and that's in the Antioch days, then it becomes known as the image of Edessa in 534. And then from 534, it ends up going up to Constantinople, becomes known as the Mandelian, and then becomes the Shroud of Constantinople. And then from there, we've now filled in the interim gap that ends up being eventually the Shroud that appears in Lyrie in France in 1350, which ends up being the Shroud of Turin. So you've got a story now of how it all works. And we're reasonably sure that's how it is. But it's amazing how it went all the way to Italy and then back out, back to Syria, isn't it? Such were the passages of time and the fear that was going on. Last one on this little bit. Well, that's two new pieces of information I found out since we last spoke. Next one, please, George. And, of course, we concluded that first talk by talking quite a lot about the, the experience of the carbon dating in 1988, which then... Um, led most of the popular world, if not necessarily all the scientific world, but certainly most of the popular world, to thinking the shroud was dated between 1260 and 1390. I'll come back to that a bit later. But that was probably the most widespread piece of information about the shroud. And I would say 70, 80, maybe even 90% of the popular public, if they took any interest at all, then you know, concluded it must be a fake. Let's move on to what we looked at last time. Next one, please, George. So last time we looked at the whole idea of the science. We got ban began to get into the science. And we looked at the whole, particularly the forensic science around the shroud. And if you remember, I tried to describe how there is effectively two images in the shroud. The first image is the image of the crucified person when they died. And there's a lot of forensics to do with that, which you would gather like you would if you were doing a, a, a coroner's report um, and an investigation like you see on many of the TV programs about all these sorts of things. There then seems to be a second image in the shroud, which was captured by this gentleman. Seconda Pier in 1898 when he took a photograph of the shroud because when he developed that shroud image he got the negative plate like if, those of you who remember good old fashioned dark rooms and in that sense discovered something quite remarkable the negative of a negative which then came out as the image that most people would see when they look up images of the shroud on the internet or whatever today but it's quite distinctly different from the actual cloth itself. Next one, please, George. We looked at the whole business of the 1978 study called STIRP, the Shroud of Turin um, project, that's probably, well, it certainly is, not probably, it certainly is the most scientific examination of the shroud that has been conducted to date. They were given five days of complete access, 24-7. They completed all these different studies, plus more. And um, it's been that body of data that has been the main body of data that people have gone back to again and again and again with new understanding, new techniques, new computers, and everything like that. 
Next one, please, George. And we finished up last time as well by talking about out of all the other possible, well, there's, there's really three, I would say two and a half possible hypotheses for this shroud. The idea that it was paint, dye, all manner of other things that could be somehow put onto the shroud, heat even, just don't stand up. They fall apart very early on. The half of a, a possibility, other than it being the authentic um, burial cloth of Jesus, is something called the Da Vinci hypothesis. We looked at that last time. Those who support it take the idea that Leonardo da Vinci was such a master of his trade that he was not only an excellent artist, he understood he was up there with the most um, advanced surgeons of his day in terms of dissection. So he would have known how to create all the, um, the significant number of um, forensic uh, evidence that we're going to look at, or we had looked at last time. He also knew the basis of um, photography, and he actually created the image using the sun, a an image um, which resembled the, a human being, um, and then may have been a human being, and he projected that onto a cloth and was able to create the image. That's the hypothesis. I say it's only half a hypothesis because I think with what we look at tonight, you have to make your own minds up because there's no absolute proof. But I think for me, I would go as far as to say I find it almost um, impossible to see how that could be done because of some of the stuff we'll look at tonight. But you'll need to make your own minds up. The other high alternative, because you're saying, well, what's the other one then? <laughs> what's the, is that particularly on the forensic side, rather than the image side, on the forensic side, you would actually conduct a live crucifixion in exactly the same way as the Gospels. You would have to actually do it completely according, for want of a better word, to the book. And of course that creates all sorts of strange um, moral issues um, and also a reason why would you do that? And there's again still some evidence, not least the image, to argue, well, how in the world did you create that then as well? So for me, it, it's, we're starting to whittle away all the possibilities and we're coming up with some very um, clear alternatives but which you'll, from which you'll need to make your own minds up. But that's what we looked at last time. Next one, George. I'm not going to go through all the evidence like I didn't go through all the history again, but I just want to raise two points, really, um, since last we met. The whole issue to do with the blood on the shroud has some of the, some of the stuff I've been looking at since um, we last met that, uh, even a fortnight ago. Um, the level of investigation into the blood of the shroud is increasing, and the, the work, particularly as we will come on to, of a gentleman called Jesse Simpson, based on his findings from other works. So it's, he didn't do the actual research, he gathered the information from that research. Um, but his video is particularly good. Um, that this would point to a much deeper understanding of the blood in the, on the shroud, or in the shroud. And um, Kirsty and I had a conversation because this is Kirsty's field. She ought to be doing this talk, really, everyone at home, as well as um, here in church, because Kirsty's history is, um, had she stayed in London, probably would be doing a PhD in historical criminology. So this is right, right on a subject, and Kirsty and I had a conversation about the fact that, well, how could the blood be, con if the blood on the, Jesus on the cross was congealed, how could it, possibly then end up on the shroud. You know, if you've cut yourself and it's started to dry and scab over, it's not going to leave such a mark on clothing. As the, uh, What's interesting, Kirsty, is that it's, it, 
And Kirsty came up with a paper, didn't you, which we'll come back to, um, which is to do with radiation. But just remember that word radiation for a moment. Um, there is a bit of a fork at this point. There are those who see the blood as congealing, so it hasn't fully congealed. And there are those who would see it has congealed and then the effect of radiation liquefies it again. But we'll come back to that a bit later on. The whole point which is of particular note here is that the blood is the closest, I've got to get the word right, antigen, antigen profile that you can find for this blood. It's, got, it's nothing to do with an animal. Nobody, somebody as a forgery didn't go and kill a dog or a cat or a horse or whatever and try and make it from that and use the blood from that. The closest is human and here's the twist. It's not fully human. So it's human and it's type AB blood but it's not, it's close but not a complete match. Now those of you who would say you were Christians and you would say you believed in the virgin birth you would actually have an answer as to why it wouldn't be fully human. But of course, to those who perhaps are more skeptical and would say, actually, I'm not sure I can believe all that, or I find that even as, as incredible to believe as all this, then we have to concede it is a very close match, and it's the closest we know from anything, but it is strangely not completely a, 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 an exact match. So 93, 94%, something like that. Interesting, isn't it? Sudarium of Oviedo, we talked about that last time. But just to say that even they've now gone down to the size of the nose. Do you remember the Sudarium of Oviedo, the, the head cloth that would have been like a, a, a brown paper bag that would have gone over the head? It's not a brown paper bag, it's a cloth. But they've been able to measure the nose, and the nose on both the shroud and on the Sudarium is exactly the same length which is strange because it means that the, the, the correlation between the Shroud of Oviedo, which was in Spain, and we know it's been in Spain since 700, we know where it was in 600, is an exact match then, pretty much. If it was in a court of law, you would say they both came from the same person, which again creates all sorts of interesting and rather un difficult things to explain if you're going to believe it's a forgery. You've got to find a very good reason to understand the, did the artist from Italy go all the way down to, or from France, go all the way down to um, Spain and copy this somehow? And they would have had to have had incredible understanding, um, which we're only discovering now, to be able to do that. So it becomes very almost difficult to, to project forwards. Next one, please. The flogging we looked at last time, the abrasions piercing on the hands, the piercing of the side. Next one, please, George. The pollen samples. Try and remember this gondilia plant. Whenever we, have, we come to share Palm Sunday and often we have a reenactment of a passion play or whatever, or you see something on the television, what we're pretty sure now is that it was not a crown of thorns as we would conventionally understand it to be. The soldiers wouldn't have had time or been that interested in weaving a crown of thorns out of brambles or whatever. It's this particular plant, and both the sudarium and the shroud have exactly the same marks. And it was literally dug up with some sort of knife out of the ground and slammed on his head. So it was more of a skull cap than it was a crown in that sense. But the pain would have been absolutely excruciating but we know it also had flowers and berries on it, and they've been able to date those between March and May of that particular year. So it meant somebody would have had to have gone all the way to the Middle East in that ring between Syria, Lebanon, round to Israel and Egypt, northern Egypt, and found a plant, dug it up at that, exactly that time, and brought it all the way back to make into the, to pull on the shroud, which again, you know, you could say was possible, but it's very unlikely. Dirt samples similarly, 
really only come not only from Jerusalem but from the Calvary area itself and also from down by the Dead Sea. It's a particularly unique form of limestone. And then lastly, the rigor mortis and body fluids, without getting into all the technicalities, it shows that therefore the body was at that particular point when the image in the shroud was uh, created was somewhere between 60 and 72 hours after death because the rigor mortis hadn't left and also the bodily fluids hadn't started. So there's a very fine line at that point. Next one, please, George. Lastly, on this section, no wonder it took a long time last time, hey, because we were going through all this evidence, was we looked at the cloth, the fact that I find it very interesting that the, the sewing between the strip of linen that was then sewed back onto the cloth after all this took place and the cloth itself, the only example we've got in the whole world that matches the particular style of sewing comes from Masada in AD 72. So it means somebody knew how to do that particular form of stitch from AD 72 to be able to make the shroud as it is. And so, I, in conclusion, I think it's what we know, we've got now probably about a thousand examples of Roman crucifixion. Um, it's becoming quite well testified now what a Roman crucifixion would look like. Of those, this one is unique. There's no other example of crucifixion like it. It's the crown of thorns, symbolizing kingship. No example of that. The fact that the, he was lay, the scourging um, was so disproportionate to most other crucifixions, four, five, six times as many scourges. The fact that he was um, laid in, a, uh, in the shroud, which would have been a very expensive burial cloth for that period. No other example of that. And of course, from the biblical text, we, we have the spices that would have been spent by Nicodemus. We've worked out how much that would have cost, like the, the number of bottles of wine at the changing of water into wine. People have spent time trying to work all this out. And then finally, to have had a tomb that was such a, a, a beautifully crafted tomb was again pointed to it being probably that of Joseph of Arimathea. There was 70 people in the country that had this sort of wealth, this sort of resources at their fingertips to be able to bring together. And there's no example of any other crucifixion victim having that. There's been, there's, we found examples of burials, but not in the same way as this particular one. So it's very interesting. Next one, please, George. So to today, that's where we got to. Happy at home, I hope. A lot to take in, especially if you're joining us for the first time or you're playing catch-up. Please watch the previous videos if you'd like to or the other, any other videos out there. But that's a summary of where we got to. So let me just have a sip of water if that's all right. So to the image itself, to today. This is particularly taken from the work of Jesse Simpson, as I mentioned, and I want to begin with something which is quite remarkable, which is this 3D image on the, what would it be, on the left of people's screens at home, and you can see it on the left here. Um, in 1978, the image in green was taken with something called a VP8 3D imager, and it was used by um, NASA and Los Alamos with regard to working out Mars, you know, the surface of Mars and all sorts of other things. They put the image of the shroud in it, and to their remarkable um, amazement, out came a 3D image. Cloths like this don't have 3D images. It's not a memory of lumps and bumps, like we talked about the folds, if you remember. This is in a cloth that has got, is exactly the same as if we had a cloth on this table. And yet, it not only has an image in it, it has a 3D image in it. And of course, the big question then is, how in the world did it get there? But it was because of that 1978 study that four scientists who were traveling in a car called the Carpool, one of which was John Jackson and Ray Rogers and others, 
That's what got them excited enough to write to the, to the then king of Italy, in Turin, who was the then custodian of the shroud, because it wasn't owned by the Catholic Church until after the king died. And, that, and he allowed this team in 1978 to go in and look at the shroud and gain all this scientific evidence. So it was this 3D image that really excited them. What's, been able, what's incredible, isn't it, if you look at these two pictures, is with modern technology and computers and everything like that, what, which is the image on the left, the grey image, how you can actually perfect that original, those original pictures. Do you see what I mean? This is how technology has really moved on and helped us uh, in, this, in these works, and uh, to the point where they've actually made a model, 3D model, of who Jesus would look like. And although people don't know quite how that was done, they've even made a 3D bronze of what Jesus would look like. And if you go to Italy or you go to Colorado, um, to the two big museums there, you would see it. Anyway, next one, please. Don't worry, we're not going to play dice. But this is where it gets a bit technical, everybody. I don't know whether this shows it. It's the only image I can find, so I'll have to talk you through it. Can you see the two dice on the left? Yeah? I don't know whether you can see, especially if you're here. Is it all right if I move across, or do, is it better if I stand here? Stand there, okay. The dice on the bottom is it's taken, the photo is taken how you would normally take a photo. And if you then took measurement points on a photo, because the, the dice would have depth, imagine a big dice, a big square, like a, like a play dice from the little children's play area. Do you see what I mean? And if you took measurements at different points, those measurements would get wider or narrower depending on how far you were away. Does that make sense? If you're closer to the person taking the photograph, that bit would be narrower. Yes, does that make sense? And the further back you go, the Im it's a still a 2D image, isn't it? So the, the image at the, of something further back would be smaller. Yes? You with me so far? It's important we try and get this. The top dice is the same dice, but taken rather than from being where you're sat, it's taken either from infinity or it's taken from within the dice itself. Because if it's taken from within the dice itself, like a seri like any of you ever had an MRI scan? If you'd have an MRI scan and it does those thousands of photographs as you go down the body, and you imagine that happening, bits of your body are exactly the way they are as you go, yes? Making the sign of, like, you're going down a body. In that sense, instead of you getting a depth then, all the images of your dice are exactly the same because it's straight-sided, isn't it, at top and bottom? So it's like cutting it. Like if you took a bread knife and you were cutting it every millionth of, a, of an inch as you went down. Are you with me? Yeah? That's how the shroud is. The image in the shroud has not been created by somebody taking a photograph from a distance. It has to either be from infinity or it has to be from within the body itself and that process of taking to get the image as it is in the shroud has to be exactly like an MRI scanner but not from even a top or a bottom, but from within outwards. That, that, that is, there's no other way of creating it, which is very strange, but go with me with strange for a minute. What would happen otherwise, if you look at the big picture of Jesus' face, if it was taken from outside, and imagine the cloth was over Jesus' face, like you've got a face mask on, those of you in church. If you pulled that face mask off like that, what would happen is your image would move from being the face you can see now to being a big round pudding bosun face because the sides would come out, wouldn't they? Like when you take your face masks off. They're narrower when they're on your face than they are when you take it off and you flatten it out. Yes? Just nod to me if you're awake still. Good. So the point being, the image can't be created by a photograph. And this really disproves the da Vinci hypothesis. 
because their idea is that the sun would send it through a lens and the lens would have been close enough to the, to the actual cloth that it would have made the image. But it would have come out like the round pudding bows and the plate-shaped face, for instance, and other parts of the body too. It wouldn't have worked like it has done. So the only real way this image can be created is from within the body or from infinity. Okay? Next one, please. The next really strange thing, and we've sort of alluded to this, so I won't spend a long time on it, is that normally, like if it was blood or if it was created by a, a, a dye or by human decomposition or whatever, it would, the, the fibers of, the, of the, um, the flax that make up the, the linen would have all woven together and each fiber is made up of lots of fibrils, probably 100, 150 fibrils. So like any of you who've taken a, a, a copper wire apart, you see the copper wire, then you see the, the wire, then if you really unstrand it, you've got all the little fine pieces of wire. Yes? Yeah, something like that. And the reality is these are less than the width of a hair. But actually the image only appears in the top two or three. The blood congeals all the rest of the fibre. But actually the image itself only appears on the top two or three. So it can't be created by all that list of alternatives that I, create, I, I gave you because they all involve liquid, even powder, so you sprinkle powder like um, an iron powder or um, one of the, the Da Vinci hypothesis says it's silver nitrate or whatever. But the reality is even that would go deeper and, com and would congeal everything together. The only real way it can happen is by radiation and made up of UV light and gamma rays. Whew, lot to get through, isn't there? The other really strange thing Two last strange things. One is the image is exactly the same throughout the folds. And you'd think if it was made of any form of paint or whatever as it dried, as soon as you bent it, it would crack, but it doesn't. The image stays exactly the same. If you fold the cloth or whatever, it stays exactly the same. So it moves and is highly flexible. And the second thing is, it's, this is a bit complicated, how do you get the colors variation to create the image? If the image happened all at the same time with light, how do you get the image? How do, how do you get the depth? How do you get the picture of Jesus' face? Well, the point being, it's, it's the same amount of light hitting the same fiber of cloth, of the thread of the cloth, but those fibers are closer together, but the, the fibers aren't darker. They're just more of them. So it's the same amount of light that's hit it, but the number of fibers it's hit has increased because it's at that particular point in the body. That probably just sounds very, very like a minor point, but it again disproves the idea of sunlight using um, bleaching because bleaching, you would have to create the image for it to bleach certain parts more than others to get the depth perspective, and it's not there. It's just not there. So it doesn't work. There's another reason for saying the da Vinci argument has to come up with another level of t thinking if it's going to actually answer all of the issues that you find as evidence in the shroud. So it's a very technical point, and probably... It, it took me quite a while to get my head around this. I think I'm getting there. But anyway, we'll move on. So we come to what was that STIRP statement, the STIRP being that 1978 study, which is really where, if you were to draw, uh, well, where have we got to then, Matt? If you were to draw a line up into the more recent studies, this is where you would get to. And it's the statement that was offered in 1978 well, about 1982, actually. Um, and has stood now for about, probably getting on for 30 years. But then I want to take us on further again in a moment. The scientific consensus is that the image was produced by something which resulted in oxidation, dehydration, and conjugation of the, I can never say this word, polysaccharide structure of the microfibrils of the linen itself. In other words, it altered 
the very molecular structure of the fibres in much the same way as you would if you put a newspaper out in the sun, but it doesn't do it by heat. We know it couldn't have been by heat. Thus, the answer to the question of how the image was produced or what produced the image remains now as it has in the past a mystery. So how was the image produced? That 1978 study, after spending four years of their lives with the top people from Los Alamos and NASA all looking at it, we don't know. We know what it is, but we don't know how it was produced. Let's move on. Next one, please. I don't know whether you can see this because it's quite small writing, but I'll, I'll read it out to you, especially for people at home. It's the only slide with it on, though. Those who've take, taken the chemical side of things and gone even further, their belief is this. More specifically, it is the change in the carbon atoms itself within the cellulose molecule, molecule from which a single electron bond has now become a double electron bond. So if you remember back to your chemistry days, do you remember chemistry? You've got a proton and neutrons and electrons. Do you remember all this stuff? No, you're all shaking. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are shaking your heads. I think we'll do a chemistry lesson sometime. What do you reckon, everybody? Um, if, if Kay Friend ever happens to watch this, um, she was a chemist, and, and uh, so Kay, we bow to you. We'll get you to come in and do mo molecules with us one day. Um, so a molecule is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. When you mess around with things, things happen to these molecules. Bits come off, other bits get added on, and things change. We're going to do a bit more on this in a minute. But what they're saying is, with regard to this, the bond, which was the electron bond, has now been doubled up within the actual molecule of the fibril itself. So they've got a little bit further. They should be looking out into space. We've gone beyond the Hubble Space Telescope, if that makes sense. We now know what is actually happening. How it happened we're still is open for debate. We'll come back to that in a moment. But what is happening is that electrons are being added to the actual molecule, the protons themselves, within the carbon of the cellulose. In other words, it's, it's within the very DNA, folks, of what is in the shroud. Next one, please. Sorry that for the smallness of the slide. It's the only slide I've come across. So, just to summarize, heat can't produce all the effects of the image. The idea of sun bleaching can produce two, but not all three. The only one that can produce all three is UV gamma rays radiation. So we're going to explore that a bit further. Next one, please. This is where it starts to get weird, folks. You've now got three branches of study that's really happening. Most scientists are now coming to the point where they say it is gamma rays radiation and UV radiation. So if you were to ask 10 scientists to stand here, probably nine out of those 10 would say it was that. One person might go for the idea of the, either the da Vinci hypothesis or something else, all right? Something like that. But within those nine that have chosen that it is gamma rays and UV radiation, they then split <laughs> into different groups. And maybe it's all part of a whole, a bit like looking at a diamond. And what you're seeing is people looking at something which is totally new. And they're looking at it from three different aspects, and there's probably many more aspects to look at it from. Is that OK? So it could be the same one thing but they're looking at different parts of it, and they're bringing different perspectives to the same picture. So one, per one perspective um, is to still try and say, you see, do you remember when we started out on all this? One of the things we talked about was how if the Turin Shroud was 
the burial cloth of Tutankhamun. People would probably go, well, yeah, okay, it probably is then. But because we're talking faith, and because we're talking God, and because we're talking resurrection, particularly at this point now in the story, people's preconceptions of how they see all those things really will impact heavily on their beliefs and how, what they think actually happened then to the shroud. So they're happy to take its gamma rays and UV radiation, but then they say, ah, oh, but I don't believe in God, so there's got to be a natural explanation for this. It's not good science, actually. You're starting from a presupposition rather than the evidence, but you know, we'll go with what they say for a minute. A study in 2018 people who want to follow what I would loosely call, and it's very loosely called, the humanist argument, i.e. that it's a natural phenomenon created within the, our previous understanding and existing understanding of nature and how it works, is that, I've got to get this right, when an egg within a human being is fertilized, there's a microscopic, incredible amount of radiation emerge from the zinc atom within the egg. How they found this out, I do not know. But at the point of fertilization, I imagine it's because of people doing various tests when people have done IVF, because you're not going to be able to do it naturally, are you? You won't get into all that, but you know, it's a bit awkward. So within UVF, they've obviously done lots of experiments as eggs have been you know, fertilized and stuff, and within that, they found that there is a very small amount of radiation, but if you added all that radiation up, I don't think you would get to the level that we're talking about as we'll come on to see with the, what happened in the shroud. But what they're trying to say is, ah, yeah, but it's on that sort of spectrum. Do you see what I mean? So, in other words, every human being's got the ability for re resurrection. We'll come back to that in a moment. I can see some of you going, what? But actually, that's where that argument goes. In other words, there's a load of potential within each human being that they don't really yet fully know. In other words, we're living, like with some of people would say about intelligence, and our, particularly our, uh, our subconscious, we are living at about 20% capacity of what, who we really are in our modern world. Strangely, in our previous existence, say, is, um, people of like Native American Indians and Aboriginals, we were probably about 30%. What's happened is we've got more used to, we've got very focused in one aspect of our mental capacity around cognition, but that's another matter. That's that argument. I'm just laying it out there for you. Next slide. Now we're going to go back to that carbon dating thing. So this is another aspect of the diamond. Because strangely, that carbon dating from 1988, rather than being the great sort of wound that, that completely floored us, as it was seen in 1988, it may actually point to something that supports an argument about gamma rays and UV radiation. Just follow me with it, if you will, for a moment. But what you need to pick up on, do you remember the date? 1260 to 1390. Notice the difference in all that. Excuse me, I've got hiccups. Right, next slide, please, George. What's been shown is that if you were to carbon date the pews in this church, and we have carbon dated, not these pews, but we've carbon dated the pews up our neighboring church called Puxton, which is a beautiful little, very simple um, hamlet church for farmers, but has got some very old, original pews in them, benches really, they were able to carbon date those and you do that between separating out something called C12, carbon 12, which is made up of six protons, six neutrons, and carbon 14, and that's very stable, that never changes, and carbon 14, which has six, neutron, six protons and then increases through the reaction of sunlight to eight neutrons. 
but those deteriorate over time at a very fixed rate, and that's what provides you with the difference between those two, creates a graph, which you can see in this particular picture here, the lower graph, the dotted line, going across the page, and that helps you then to say, okay, so depending upon the amount of C12 and C14, I can work out how old this thing is. And usually you can draw a line and then drop it down and like with the pews up at Puxton, get a figure in Puxton's case that those benches are 1462, I think it was, give or take 10 years. Now the thing is, if they could date something with the greatest of respect to Puxton, as reasonably common as a bench to 1462 plus or minus 10 years, and yet they were looking at one of the most historic artefacts, probably the most examined artefact in the whole of history, and they couldn't find a way of dating it any closer than between 1260 and 1390, yet it's only 100 years difference, that should be telling us something. Do you see what I mean? The difference is too big. Do you see what I mean? What's interesting is if you believe that it was radiation that created the image, it mucks around uh, with your carbon-14. And so really what happens is you create a much younger cloth, but it varies depending on how close your sample is to the center of the source of that radiation. So if you imagine lots of radiation beams going up and down, up and down, up and down through this body, and we'll come on to that in a moment, but you draw a line to the edge of the cloth and you take a piece of sample from there, this argument says it will be different than if you take a sample from there. Do you see what I mean? But the difference is so great that if you took a sample from the center, oh, I want to go and point at the screen now, but if you took a sample from the center of the actual body, it would date to AD 8,500. That's how much it messes around with the carbon dating. And it's called, strangely, the neutron absorption hypothesis. I'm going to ask you all on Sunday whether you remember that word. The neutron absorption hypothesis. I'm not really. But are you with me a little bit? Sort of. So the idea is the normal way of messing around, of Creating carbon dating is skewed by this experience of the radiation. It's not a uniform alteration. It varies depending upon how close the sample is to the cloth. And guess what? When they look, I won't, I won't go into all the detail, but I can show you the slides. When you look at where those samples were taken, they were taken in a line. Oxford was the furthest out. Guess what? 1260. Next one, I forget which one was next, but I think it was the American one was last, so it must be Italy was next, about 1300. When you looked at America, 1390. See what I mean? So the cl those were just three in a line closer towards the center of the cloth. So if you followed that on, it follows that you end up with some crazy stuff until we can actually have another sample that would actually be taken from the center of the cloth, which I don't think the church are ever going to allow us to do. That would prove it. That what is interesting is if they'll allow us to have some of the ash that was taken from where those burn marks were, that would give us much closer, because the difference is so great each time, that would be much closer to the center, so that might say it was 2021 AD or something like that. So it's interesting, isn't it? But strangely then, the carbon dating in 1988 actually becomes an argument to support the idea of X rays, uh, of, of gamma rays and UV rays being the source of the inf image in the shroud when we thought it was a big you know, hole in the coffin. Interesting, isn't it? Moving on. Now we get into some very strange stuff. This lady, Dame Isabel in 2004, she's into quantum physics, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but 
she noticed something very strange in the shroud. For the image to be the way that it is, it's like the cloth had to be very tight, like if you were trying to take, well, like the screen up here, everybody. If you just hung it on one of these little popper things, it would have folds in it and creases, and the image would go all weird, wouldn't it? It has to be pulled tight and stretched. And what she discovered was that, really, that's the same as what needed to happen in the cloth of, of the shroud. Yet we know it was tied at the head, and it was tied at the feet, and possibly tied around the waist. So something strange happened. The second thing she noticed was that because of the back of the cloth has exactly the same, not the same image, but the same intensity of image, the same outline of image as the front, in other words, picking it up exactly as it would be, if, is that the body, the, the, can you see the blue line in this? Can you see the blue line running through the middle of the body? It had to come from that center line at exactly the same time. So that's how it had to happen. And then the third thing she discovered, and this is where it's so, is that because the image that's then created doesn't have the indents of the body, which would have weighed the same amount as I weigh now, or what, well, actually Jesus would have been a lot, uh, a lot lighter than me, but if I was to lie down, if any of you were to lie down, without being too rude, you would have indentations on your bottom. Yes? Some would have indentations more than others, but I would have, you know, we would all have indentations of some sort or another. Just trying to lighten the load a little bit. It's pretty heavy duty stuff. So, what she noticed is there's nothing. It's as if the body is being suspended. Now, we've all seen the magic tricks with Paul Daniels and Dynamo and stuff, but we're talking for real here. There's no wires, there's no tricks or anything like it. And this obviously, a bit like the person who discovered the 3D image or the person who discovered the original photographic image, it set her thinking and trying to work out, well, what in the world's going on? The only thing she can come up with is that it was, the body was, in some sense or other, levitating. And you go, well, how in the world can it do that? I mean, that's, that's really strange. Light might be one thing, I'm trying to get my head around that, but to levitate as well, what in the world's going on? Just go with me for a moment. If you can pick up one word, it's called an event horizon. And an event horizon occurs, one of its, its characteristics is it creates zero gravity around it. Right? Remember zero gravity, remember event horizon. Next one, please, George. If you now go into the other end of what most people would think we were talking about tonight, which is the creation of the world and universe and black holes and Stephen Hawking and all the rest of it, what we know is that these event horizons take place around black holes. And they bend all the laws of physics. So the laws of physics that we normally understand of gravity, Newton and his apple, don't work. It actually creates what's known as singularity, and singularity creates a whole new set of understandings of physics. And if you ask this lady, who is an absolute expert in her field, to be fair, hence why she's been made into a dame and all the rest of it, just like Stephen Hawkins was made Sir Stephen Hawkins and all the rest of it. And obviously we need to check all this out. What her hypothesis is, Actually, these two, it's the only other explanation of what was happening to the body in the shroud. Was that it was a, the equivalent of the birth of a new universe. A new creation. In one body. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Next one. Of course, many people would say this is some really, okay, there are scientists, like there are vicars, you can get somebody to say whatever you want really if you try and find somebody long enough. Is any of this 
got any sense of credibility at all? Or is it just somebody out on a limb somewhere making this uh, statement? What's interesting is there's a gentleman who's called Edgar Mitchell. Now, Edgar Mitchell isn't just a, a, a sort of an also-ran. He was the sixth man on the moon. He's been part of the Apollo space missions and NASA and everything like that. He's really into quantum physics in a big way. He heads up a whole big institute and everything like that. His belief is it's only now just emerging that we know about particles and we know about energy and sunlight, for instance, how that is an energy force and things like that. What we didn't realize was that alongside the energy, there's an equal and if not more powerful other source, which is to do with information and consciousness. So as well as seeing you know, an explosion of light on our television screens, like on um, one of the science programs about a creation of a star or something like that, what we now know is that there is a comparable but invisible information stroke consciousness explosion, if you like, at the same time. That's the only way quantum physics can work. And we know it's the same across the whole universe. And his belief is what's going on in the body is comparable to that incredible explosion. But what that means is that what happened in this body has the potential to have sent out a message, if you like, across the whole universe of what was happening. And obviously that creates a very strange and yet strangely biblical understanding of resurrection because it wasn't just good news for Jesus that he came back to life on Easter Day. Because again, you know, I've spent a lot of time, year after year, trying to encourage us as a Christian community to really understand what resurrection means. And you know, there are people who can go into this far better than I can, but I've tried to do it at a popular level. Resurrection isn't just Jesus sort of went, I was dead, but now I'm back to life again. Ta-da! That's resuscitation. Resurrection is that Jesus went through death, out the other side, into new life. And that new life was not good, just good news for Jesus, it was the transformation, the beginning of the transformation of the world. St. Paul, as we'll le read at the end of this, says, Jesus is the first fruits of the new creation. Does that make sense? I do this with children, with one of those pop-up tunnels. You know those pulley, pulley out tunnels and you can crawl through? And I talked about them going in and coming back out the same way, but can you go through and come out the other end? But that's what happened to Jesus as best we can understand it in biblical terms. That's what the Bible says. That's what St. Paul said right in the beginning, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And also what's strange is that this seems to be bearing, being borne out by the scientists who aren't necessarily Christians who are actually looking at the Shroud of Turin. Interesting, isn't it? Next one. We're going to finish with this one because you've sat there a long time, but we're nearly done in terms of the information. This is one of the latest studies. Um, it's, taken, it's done by um, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Space Sciences at Palermo in Italy. What they did was they took some plates that had not been tampered with in any way from photographs taken of the shroud in 1931, so they've basically been put in a safe somewhere and kept. And that's important because people can say, well, you amended the plates. But what they then have done is done quite a lot of work on it using absolutely state-of-the-art camera work and, in, and uh, computer work. The results have not yet been peer-reviewed. What that means is other scientists haven't looked at that work and said, yeah, we think it's true. So it's yet to be peer-reviewed. doesn't mean it's not true. It's just saying they haven't yet said it is true. Next one, please, George, if that's all right. Nearly done. Because this is where it gets very weird, but from another perspective. Do you know what a stroboscopic effect is? If you 
You know what a stro strobe light is, where you get lights, people dancing in nightclubs? Do you remember nightclubs? No. Okay. Um, hopefully that will make you laugh. I would love to take you all to a nightclub when we can. We could set one up in here. So if you have a strobe light, you move your arms or legs like that, dancing, you see. But it makes it jerk like that because the light's coming on and off very, very fast. Yes? Okay. Can't believe I'm dancing for you. Okay. So in this understanding, what they have found with their very, very high-level cameras is that there's not one image. Their belief is that there are multiple images. So this event horizon didn't just happen once. It happened a number of times because you can see Jesus' arm move and you can see his leg move. In other words, you're seeing him emerge into new life, not go come back to life, actually emerge into new life. Is that weird? But you're actually seeing him move. But what they know is that the, the image has to be, for this to work, for the shroud to be the way it is, because this, this is what we keep coming back to. You've got to come back to the evidence. How is it the way it is, rather than just, well, this is my theory, it has to be for something like one fortieth of a millionth of a second each of these strobe effects. And it has to be each time with billions of watts of UV light. And we haven't got enough UV scanners on the planet, let alone today, let alone at the time of the shroud, whether that be 1260 or previously in you know, Jesus' day, 33 AD, for this to actually have happened. It's quite incredible. Quite incredible. As I say, their findings have got to be um, looked at, but I ran out of time in preparation for you, but another time, another place, if you ever want more. There is, um, they found another a number of, of additional factors which may or may not add to some of the existing evidence. I mean, it's all got to be looked at. Um, but for instance, they have found um, the fact that there's a cloth that comes down over Jesus' face. And you can see in other, other studies, they found that it's where the, where the cloth was tied around the, the, the top knot, if you like, and then it came down the front, and it was tied around the waist, and then it would have gone down and tied around. And they've actually been able to measure all that, and it fits the side cloth, the, the side strip of the cloth exactly. So whether that is that 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 was how it was done, maybe. They found that the top knot, this gets a bit controversial, but has a lady's bracelet attached to it. Could that have been Mary Magdalene's bracelet she used, or Mary? Jesus' mother, who knows? There's also, there's a, on all the images we know, there's an indent in Jesus' forehead there. And one argument is that that is, and it's called a particular thing, and I can never remember what it's called, but it's the box that Jewish rabbis would wear on the forehead, holding the Torah next to them. Whether he was crucified with that, I don't know. Whether it was the fact that the box had been moved away, but it was there. But they think they may have even found the leather straps, because you also wear it around your arm as well. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and seen Orthodox Jewish people, you know, real strong Orthodox. But they think they may have found that. They think they may have found a belt that went around his waist, um, was put around his waist at some point. Really strange things that they're finding. And of course, one of the things is, it doesn't necessarily change the big picture, but they are adding detail to that big picture. And of course, it now needs to be reviewed and go through processes and understood and whatever. Um, but I think the big news is the idea that the resurrection may have been a series of events over a few seconds, which we can actually picture then Jesus moving his arm. It's very difficult to see how that is any other way than it is in moving his arm to actually set himself free. Next one. So, let's bring it all together. Okay, you've sat there long enough. 
What we've looked at over this time is, and this is the summary of Jesse Simpson, but I would totally agree with it. I don't quite go as far as he does, but I would go as nearly as far. Here's a summary. I won't go through all that. Can you read it or not? Is it a bit small? I'll just quickly read it out to you. Here is a summary of all the evidence we've looked at over these three sessions. So not just tonight, but actually over all three sessions. Can the evidence, if you stack it all up, show that it could be a medieval forgery or could it be authentic? The image formation we've looked at in detail tonight, the chances of it being a medieval forgery on the level that we've just talked about is pretty small. In fact, I would go as far as to say I agree with Jesse Simpson, it's impossible. But it is authentic to the Bible. The whole blood stains issue, we've looked at it in a little bit more detail. You could have actually found somebody who had this very rare AB blood and wasn't fully human somehow. Don't know how. But you could, have, you could potentially find some way of doing the blood stuff and all the, all the marks and everything like that. Same with the forensic science. You would have to go to Jerusalem. You would have to go to um, you know, know all the different parts of all this, put it all together, but in theory you could do it. The sidereum correlation, it's almost impossible to see how that could work. The, the head cloth being so tight, a, an example of what's in the shroud. If somebody even went to Spain and painted it, they would have had to have had modern molecular understanding. Um, forensic science, molecular understanding with, with um, molecular telescopes. Very difficult to see how that could be done. The physical analysis, looking at all the information about the shroud, where it came from, the cloth and all that business. Again, very difficult to understand how that could possibly have known that, including the image being on the two, two top fibrils of the cloth. And then the very first talk, we had the whole um, stuff to do with the um, the history of the shroud and showing how it's got this now probably fairly fairly okay steady history right the way back depending on how far back you want to go you could go back as far as AD 68 when Peter and Paul um, were probably um, still operating and maybe the shroud either with them or probably with their later disciples, because Peter and Paul were probably in Rome by then, um, would have actually taken, the, the, the following disciples would have taken the shroud there just before the fall of Jerusalem. You would have to, if it's a forgery, you'd have to find an explanation, not just for that event, but all the subsequent events through Edessa, Antioch, and Constantinople, etc. Lastly, the carbon dating, well, certainly, at best, we can say it's now questionable. We haven't looked at the other alternative to the later dating, which we looked at the first time, which was that there was a, a patch also woven into the cloth, which we know is there, um, which will in, it, in it for itself, Ray Rogers, who did the first study, said, this shows we've taken the sample from the wrong part, guys. Um, so for two reasons, not let alone one, um, that carbon dating now needs to be looked at. Um, so I come to what St. Paul had to say when he wrote his letter to the church in Corinth all those years ago. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. I think after spending probably a few hundred hours work so far on all this, I come to that statement and it's almost like coming full circle. So it's always been there. But like so often with God, we can go off on a journey, just like the Exodus journey, and yet we still find we come home. But we come home to a new understanding from where we start again, and we'll go around again and again as we grow in him. So I leave you all 
um, with your own decisions as to whether you think what you think of the Turin Shroud. I've tried to lay out, I don't think I've managed to get all the evidence for you. I think I've managed to get probably 70 or 80 percent of the evidence up to recent times. Forgive me if there is stuff that I haven't quoted tonight or in previous talks. I've tried to do my best. There is still more to be done. Um, I'm working through another couple of um, videos at the moment. They tend to be an hour and a half long. It's late night viewing. Um, but on the other hand, it still excites me because new things are being discovered all the time. <laughs> we'll give it a break for a while. We'll give it a break for a while if that's all right. Um, but on that note, thank you ever so much for listening. Thank you for those joining us at home. Hope it's not been too boring. We've tried to make it quite exciting. And uh, thank you to my tech team. Bless them. To George and to Kirsty, who have done so much to make this possible. And thank you for turning out. Cheers, everybody. It's different, isn't it? They're gone, have they?